Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, Brady Kiernan makes his feature film directorial debut with Stuck Between Stations, a love story with an impressive cast set in Minneapolis. Students from the Purpich Center Arts High School create a performance inspired by a Minnesota short story. Bobby V's pop music stardom began the day the music died, when in 1959 he performed in place of Buddy Holly. Come back tomorrow night and try it again. This is Minnesota Original. I said I was gonna go play some bug hunter, so. So, you were trying to impress me with your terrible shooting? Seriously? Why do you know so much about guns? Because uh, I'm from America. Cut. Cut! Cutting! Okay, reset back to one. Pitcher's next. We are in the warehouse district of downtown Minneapolis. Uh, we are shooting some uh, additional scenes for Stuck Between Stations. Uh, right now, fellas are setting up a dolly shot. Who doesn't want to make a feature film? This is kind of a dream come true. My name is Brady Kiernan. I am an independent filmmaker. Uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I also work as a line producer and a production manager for commercial production. Hey, guess who I ran into tonight? No, Becky Fine. Yeah, with the buckskin jacket, with the fringe. But it's like I couldn't even tell if it was her because she was with a couple real... Oh, hey, let me call you back later, or tomorrow, or whatever. Our film is called Stuck Between Stations. It's about a soldier who's home from war on bereavement leave, who meets a girl that he had a crush on in high school and junior high, and they spend this one magical, romantic night together touring the late night empty streets of Minneapolis. How come I haven't seen you in like 10 years? I'm just in town for a couple of days. My dad died. Man, I'm so sorry. I mean, thanks, but it's okay. I got excited about film uh, when I was very young, our father bought a home video camera, and my brothers Spence, Andy, and Pat and I would make music videos and movies. And then when I got to high school and college, started taking classes in film. And that's when I started getting excited and thinking, like, I could maybe do this as a career. When did you guys run out of dialogue? Over there? Uh -huh. I got no I got no headset for this right first stuff. That, right about the bench, just before the bench. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. That actually times out perfectly then. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is my feature film directorial debut. I have made some music videos and some short form documentary stuff. We did a series of videos for POS where we did five music videos in five days for his album Never Better. a short documentary for Doom Tree, but this would be the, pretty much the biggest thing I've ever done. So you do this a lot? What? Take girls around the back of your BMX. It worked like a charm when I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> I think our goal in making this film was to tell just a good love story. Hey, Casper. Oh. We're just gonna be like friends tonight. We're not gonna kiss or anything. Who says I even wanna kiss you? Our two lead actors, Sam Rosen and Zoe Lister-Jones, have a wonderful chemistry. They've been friends for a while, and uh, where we're really able to get like, real moments of two people having fun. You think you can handle this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I can. 
Oh. <laughs> Fine. Defense wins championships. Defense wins championships. I like working on independent films that feel uh, unique and um, like they're telling a new story. And um, Brady seemed like a really cool guy, you know, silent genius. So yeah, it's been great. It's been everything that I hoped it would be times 10. You know what I mean? Just how impressive he and all the crew have been, the set that you know he runs and the environment that he creates. So what was the nest? But you don't know the turkey's nest? Uh-uh. Well, bar, me and this dude used to work at over behind campus. Best job I've ever had. And yet you still managed to get yourself fired. Josh Hartnett plays a supporting role in our film through our network of friends. We were able to get him the script. We kind of presented it to him as, you know, here's a role that you don't get necessarily play all the time. And he got excited about participating. This dude got caught doing the drugs at work. No, false. I never got caught doing drugs at work. I showed up for work high that one time. That's it. He brought a level of physicality to the character, like brought it to life with little effort. Rebecca, I need to talk to you. Where is it, David? She's home. I couldn't get it. She's home. She's home. That's weird, because that's also your home, so. I'm not ready to face her yet, OK? I don't think we met. I'm David. You a friend of hers? Yeah, that's my new boyfriend. We're running away to join the circus together. What do you think? This is some kind of joke? Michael Imperioli also plays a supporting role in our film. He was Christopher in The Sopranos. He was also in the movie Goodfellas. Once his name came up in conversation of that particular role, we all got very excited about the possibility of him being that, because you don't get to see him play like a sleazy college professor. He was able to create a couple of very real moments of fireworks. It was pretty exciting to watch. Why do you hang out with those guys? I don't really. But they're your friends. No, not really. You said they were. Yeah, this film is very deeply related to Minneapolis. Uh, the writers, Nat Bennett and Sam Rosen, are both from here. And this movie is kind of like a love letter to the culture that I grew up around, which is full of art and all deeply rooted in this city and the different neighborhoods of the city. And I feel like there's a whole lot more that we'll continue to, to find ways to show, but this is a really good like beginner's course in Minneapolis. One influence as we were kind of plotting out the aesthetic and look of the film uh, is actually the De Stiel movement from the turn of the last century. We knew that we were going to do a split screen motif because this is a movie about two people and we wanted to try and have them on screen as much as possible. That influenced a lot of our choices for lighting, for wardrobe, for composition, and hopefully that type of stuff is subconscious. What's important to me is that the story comes across and the relationship of the two people. I feel like that's, that pace is all right. I mean, this is so wide that like, you know, we're getting, this is basically like we're getting wild lines of this dialogue to go along with the close coverage that we're gonna do. Yeah. I would say my style as a director is very reminiscent of, I guess the people that I admire, a filmmaker named Sidney Lumet who made Network, Dog Day Afternoon, 12 Angry Men. The most important thing for me when it comes to any kind of conversation about me as an artist is the multitude of people that have supported and collaborated with me. I'm attracted to filmmaking because it is a collaborative art form. Yeah, cut. That's a cut! You wanna do this again or you wanna move on? I'm happy with it. Bo, how you feel? Okay, moving on, we're gonna cross the street. The Minneapolis film scene is a wonderful scene, but we haven't had a breakout indie success that helps independent filmmaking thrive here. I feel like there are still a lot of unique landscapes and stories to tell here. My hope is that we can elevate our film scene to something that's recognized nationwide, worldwide. I'm just hoping to make, make movies for the rest of my life and hopefully live here. Yes.
Can I ask you a question? Why did you hang out with me tonight? I want you to sell my fingers as wind chimes. Take my thin bones for silverware. Use the hollow of my skull to serve your dinner. Paper your walls with my skin. Dust the windowsills with my eyelashes. Grind my teeth to powder and keep them in clear jars above the stove. Make music on my spine, sweep the floors with my hair. I would grow a garden for you. And The Land Shall Remain is an interdisciplinary, site-specific piece. And it's based on the story Gravestone of Wheat by Will Weaver. It's, it's a story that starts out with a man at his wife's funeral, and he ends up burying her in the wheat field and growing wheat over the place where her body was buried. The whole idea is to take that time period and what happens to the two main characters and develop music, choreography, and theater uh, around that story. The Arts High School is for 11th and 12th graders for kids from all over the state of Minnesota, and they major in one of six art areas, dance, theater, music, media, literary arts, visual arts, and now an interdisciplinary art area. One of the great things about the program here at the Arts High School is it's really focused in on student-made work. We're not doing the 1,000th rendition of West Side Story. The students write plays, direct plays, act in plays. The, the dancers do not um, just look at the newest hip-hop moves of somebody else. They create their own. All of the students read the short story, and they actually worked with our literary arts teacher to look at it from like an English perspective, a language arts perspective, looking at themes um, and especially the rituals of daily life. We all had assignments to look at um, pictures from the era, like post-World War I, 20s, 30s era. We read old letters, diary entries. We've been having a pouring rain, which I think will do an immense amount of good. The river was high, ready to spill over its banks. I had never seen such water. So we had this text, and then we had these visual images, and then literary arts and music and dance and theater all separated and started to create their own material. There was no like set choreographer, so we worked as a group and co-choreographed each piece. The first time that we actually read through the short story, uh, everybody was kind of just like, uh, what are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> yeah, so it, it was really difficult. So the lit teacher came down and helped us, you know, get the juices flowing. It's supposed to be unison, because it's supposed to go one, one, boom, boom, one. Two. Okay, well we can, what do you want it to be? Do you, you're, you're the choreographers. The moves are definitely like earthy because they're really grounded. And even when we're doing like kicks, they're parallel to the ground. So it's like we're kind of ignoring the sky in a way because it's not about what's up there, it's about what we're walking on right now. One of the things that surprised me is just the, the beauty of the music and how then the dancers are able to um, work with the music. It's just really striking. Going back to where I started Going back to where I'm from Gonna pack these old dreams up. Oh, I'm gonna run. Oh, I'm gonna run. And I ain't seen the sunshine since.
since God knows when Just waiting for the spring to come To carry my burden To carry my burden We were working towards a product that was going to be site-specific in Terrace, Minnesota. We wanted to pre present this piece in the area that the story was written about. We had one of our performances in Terrace, Minnesota, which is where my grandparents on my dad's side were born and passed away. It was such a cool experience that I probably will treasure for the rest of my life, bringing my friends to where I live. And my mom started crying, and she's like, oh, it just gave me such inspiration. And um, my dad, and who's a farmer, and his cousin, who's all farmer, they brought their family, and they just couldn't believe that juniors and seniors were able to have all this inspiration and um, artistic expression we wanted to pour out into this short story. A lot of people were really moved by it because they live there, so they know what it's like. And us, not really knowing what it's like, but embodying what it would be like in that time period and showing them, they kind of got it. So then right away, it brought tears to like a lot of people's faces. I think that the students learned that collaboration, while hard, is really worthwhile. I think that they live it. When they're actually performing it, the kids are living it. And as an audience member, to watch young people take this on and own it is um, it's really emotional. It's very powerful. I've never really been to a farm before, and I don't know what it's like. So as a person who's like mainly in the city, you kind of get to see how other people think when we dance the pieces. I feel really spiritual actually because it's not like you're praising like a god like high up it's more like you're praising like mother earth and like all that she's giving you because it's gravestones of wheat. Dig holes in my eyes and bury seeds in my pupils. Choke my lips to the brim with dirt. And I want you to plant a tree between my shoulder blades. It's almost like they're ghosts. Their ghosts coming back, and you can see generations and generations in this performance. They scream, they shout, they weep, they jump. They send him a thousand letters a week, and they love him more than anyone they know. It's crazy, barbaric, fascinating. This is the story of our teenagers, worshiping an image they've created. The story of a teenage idol, Bobby V. Ain't no guy in town who would ever try to put me down when I'm walking, walking with my angel. My name's Bobby V. I'm an 18-year-old singer from uh, Fargo, North Dakota. It all started about three years ago, back in uh, Fargo, my hometown, when I got together with my brother and two other kids and formed a small rock and roll band called The Shadows. Susie, baby, where are you? Have you left me for some or one new? Susie, baby, where are you? Have you left me for someone new? So this is a little thing. I made it up in, in when I was in board at high school. I, it, it was born out of uh, a teenage lust or something. I don't know. I was, I was, uh, you know, 15 years old, 16 years old when I recorded the song. Is your love light shining bright? Came out in uh, the summer of 1959 and got all kinds of airplay in the upper Midwest. Susie, baby, don't you know? That was uh, the, the springboard of my whole record career. We were launched on our career by a tragedy. 
It was February 2nd, 1959. A plane carrying three rock and rollers heading for the Moorhead Armory where they were scheduled to appear that night crashed over Iowa. The three victims of the crash were Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. And I came home in the afternoon and my brother told me that the three artists uh, who were scheduled to be on the show that night were killed. I was so uh, um, stunned by this whole event because Holly was my, he was my hero and uh, I had a ticket for the show. I mentioned to him that a local disc jockey had put out a plea for talent for the show that night. Charlie Boone, that was a guy, He's, he was in uh, Fargo at that time as a disc jockey. The whole group got together and we started uh, discussing whether we should or shouldn't go on with the show. And I guess I was the only one that was actually against it, uh, mainly because I was scared. We'd uh, never played before a live audience. We weren't even a band, and we didn't have a name. And in the end, uh, we decided to go on with the show. And then I got to thinking, well, we kind of never played before, you know, and uh, I don't really know what to do or anything. Got to us, and Charlie Boone said, OK, you guys are on. We said, what's the name of the band? And everybody stared at the floor. We didn't have a name. And I finally said, the shadows. And, and, and it was this fast. He said, OK, ladies and gentlemen, the shadows. I was almost in a coma by the time the curtains opened up. <laughs> It changed my life, really. I mean, the thing changed my life. I, mean, I, I wouldn't even be here if it had, hadn't been for that show. Come back tomorrow night and try it again. Ooh. This is the original band, uh, 1959, Bobby V and the Shadows. There's my brother, uh, myself, uh, Stolman, Jim Stolman, and Bob Corum. Um, and the gold records, there's some of them. This is um, Take Good Care of My Baby. Take good care of my baby. This is a, a hit, a gold record from uh, London on Rubber Ball. This is what we did for marketing in, in uh, 1959. The um, guy that was managing us, Bing Bingston, he said, we're gonna have a little contest to find the real Susie baby. They chose the young lady that won, I guess if, if, if you call that winning. Uh, I picked her up in my 53 Oldsmobile and we went out for, for dinner and, and I dropped her off at home. And that was it. But uh, isn't that something? Well, it survived all these years. Don't forget to stay right in the mic for me, Bobby. Mm, he's your new flame, but when you hear my name, you won't forget me. I, I loved being in the studio. I loved it. I loved it. Even more than being on stage, to be in a studio. You can really paint your pictures. There were a lot of songs that were left in the dust in the whole process of uh, making records. And I got to thinking about those songs. You won't forget the love, you won't forget the love, the love I gave you. They went and found boxes of tapes like these and, and uh, acetates. These are the... Tell me <laughs> yeah, this is Ferguson Road. It's a Carol King song. And it says on here, uh, sorry, bad mixes. That was the, <laughs> the guy that was uh, producing it at that time. Uh, but uh, it, it might be a bad mix, but it's not a bad song. And, and it can be properly mixed, and that's what we're here for. Uh, hey, 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 just one more time. It's all back that's there. What I did. You don't hear hiccups very much anymore. <laughs> just one more time. 130 some odd tracks. Everybody seems to be blown away that there could be this much material that was never released. It made sense to us to tell the rest of the story. We have talked about him being lumped into that early 60s pop genre teen of Idol. Teen Idol, the Bobby Rydell, the Fabian, the Frankie Avalon. Most people that are his music historians and follow that time period know that he was way more of the singer than most of those people were. And this back catalog of music shows that. The fact that he's got six albums worth of material laying around that nobody's ever heard shows that they were really trying to get his voice on as many things as they could. 
we all have our angels and yet I suppose we all have our devils that's just how it goes and it wouldn't change a thing I'm so blessed to be doing what I'm doing and, and to be in, in this business that it's over 50 years and to have my family in the music business. Some distant promise of life to you not bring. No, I wouldn't change a thing. What else do you want? What do you need? We got this is what we do, you know. I, think I can still do it. singers that uh, have had uh, more hit records than I have that have suddenly disappeared. Nobody's indispensable, you know, if the public, I guess, is fickle, you know. If uh, you're not coming across with it, what they want, then they'll get somebody that is. I think about it a lot of times, if, uh, if something happened, you know, people say, well, what are you going to do, you know, are you going to go back and work in a service station and stuff, and uh, there again, I don't think I'm the type of person that would... Uh, uh, just go back and settle for something like that. I've got enough ambition where I, I know uh, if I did get into some other field, uh, you know, even out of show business, I'd uh, do my best to succeed, you know, and not uh, be satisfied with, uh, with just anything. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.